splinter of bone. Deep in the heart of the Prison of Elders, Varix of House Judgment clutched a splinter of bone as he watched the solar system burn. The facility had been outfitted over the years with massive sensor grids slaved to the arrays spread across the reef. They gave him a detailed analysis of the Red Legion's fury. The light from the monitors was the only illumination in the room as his arms flew across the controls. Relaying warnings to Petra and the Awoken, he could already see the remainder of the Awoken fleet disappearing off his scopes, going into hiding. Relaying warnings to the city, though he could see he was far too late. Their comms were gone. There was no one left to listen. Relaying warnings to his people. With the end of the houses, there were so few who would listen, but if he could save even a handful... While his hands worked, his eyes remained fixed on the screens, watching death, destruction, and horror. In his role working with the guardians of the city, he'd pored over the distress signal from the Dantillion Exodus 6. Source Green Raven had sent bursts of analysis to the tower at least a dozen times since the days of the Taken War, but he'd never expected numbers of this magnitude. With the systems of the last city offline, he had no problem dialing sensors over the wall. He'd been able to see with clarity the home of humanity, with a resolution where he could make out parks and lakes and marketplaces. These same sensors let him watch, grinding the bone in his mechanical fists as people died, as the great machine was yoked, as the guardians fell. Scrambling, he alerted the crows, but something went wrong. The network had fallen dark, each and every crow offline, all that is save for one. Through a garbled image, he saw a hand, an awoken hand, but it almost immediately fell to static. He wanted to care, he wanted to feel something for them. What dominated his thoughts, though, what made a ticking noise emanate deep in his voice synth, was the growing fear that the Queen's plan had failed. He sat back in his chair, thinking. The Prison of Elders orbited far enough away from the core awoken outposts, and thus far enough away from the Cabal's phalanx, that it might come out of this unscathed. Nonetheless, he initiated lockdown procedures, prepared for the worst. A comping, confirmation, Petrovenge and the limited forces at her command evacuated what settlements they could and disappeared into the nooks and crannies of the reef. She would be unable to send help to the prison. First House Judgment, then House Wolves, then Kel Marasov. Now he could feel the rest of his adopted people slipping away from him. With one of his mechanical arms, he crushed the splinter of bone to dust. She's been silent too long. The whole solar system groans with the bruises of war. Aldrin lives in constant suffering, a numb, scowling pain that drives him to ether and worse distractions. He has never felt a light this strong. He has never known pain so deep. How many centuries with his sister, and how quickly he's disintegrated without her? Why won't she speak to him? The reef burns around him. Shattered asteroids and cracked habitats spill bright flakes of debris. There is nothing quite so stark and brilliant as sunlit wreckage in vacuum. The reef is huge. Huge, but dense too. Its structures and people gathered in tight clusters against the vastness of space. Oryx and the Red Legion ripped great holes in the reef. Oh, if only Ultron had told Petra that Traug's broken legion was a Trojan horse. But Ultron has nothing to give to a regent who surrenders her people to the Traveler. She has always wanted Mara's approval, little Petra. Always wanted to integrate herself. But she never understood what Mara respects. She's never been willing to take the hard road to Mara's trust. That's why Mara doesn't speak to Petra. But Mara has not been speaking to Aldrin either. He kicks off the wrecked hull of the corvette. He and the kings have been raiding the asteroid belt, knocking out shipping heading for Earth, trying to further destabilize the reef. Aldrin has killed his own subjects, and at first that left him wretched with guilt, curled up in the hard cell where he sleeps. But didn't Mara lead thousands of her subjects to their death? 
for a still enigmatic greater good? How is this any different? She has always intended her people for the altar. The Awoken are pawns in her design. It's up to Aldrin to set that design back on track. Mara! He shouts up into the starlight. He has come too far to beg now. He's done too much. He demands her answer. I'm not angry. I forgive you for... for sacrificing yourself to save them. But you must answer me now. Am I on the right path? Am I nearer to finding you? He has the House of Kings as allies. His raids on the reef have forced Petra to pull back, consolidate, focus on protecting her citizens instead of collaborating with the Guardians. But is he any closer to Mara? Has he... can he trust himself to do this? He always wanted to surprise Mara, to make her recalculate her plans. But it would help him so much to know that she foresaw a little of this, to be certain he'd headed the right way. Mara, he cries, blinking against the persistent soreness of his right eye. Sister, have you forsaken me? Something answers him. Just a whisper, just a brush of reassurance, just a quaver. Aldrin, my rescuer. He follows the voice. The violence of his thruster burns bruises his body. Down from the tumbling corvette to the harnessed asteroid below, where the shattered servitors and the wreckage of shanks mark the site of a losing battle, guardians ambushing a fallen party. His suit's chemo scepters detect a trace of ether. He follows it in, and there it is, a fallen archon, crumpled in the dust. Ether hisses through entry and exit wounds cauterized by brutal solar flames. The mark of the golden gun. Aldrin hisses in disgust as he traces Guardian's footprints in the dust. They must have sprinted off together in a rush, no doubt to farm some other site where skiffs were coming down with mining parties. He triages the Archon's wounds. Mortal. The victim is shaking now, trembling under Aldrin's hands. He wants so badly to do something, anything to ease the poor soldier's passing. To have the power some say his sister had, to save just by proximity. Does he wish it? Does he wish to save this poor thing? He does, he does. His eyes burn with sympathetic tears as he works to bind the Archon's wounds. His hands are quick and gentle, and he weeps with the strength of his hatred for the guardians that did this. As tears stain the Archon's wounds, the ether roiling through Aldrin's fingers slowly grows heavier, darker, more noxious. He does not notice. Finally, he leans back to smear his knuckles across his eyes. Sore. They're always so sore. Under the unmarked helmet, four dead eyes open in wonder. The Archon croaks a word. A broken leftover of a dying hallucination, calling out to whoever he wanted to see welcome him into the afterlife. Dad? He has come to the realization that it no longer matters if he doesn't know what to do or if he's doing the right thing. What matters is that he wants. If he wants to find Mara and save her, if he wants to do the right thing fiercely enough, if his intentions are good and powerful, he will find the way. He just has to believe in himself. No more paralyzing analysis, no more painful regrets. He has to go forward without doubt. The Awoken are a beautiful creation. He must keep them safe. Secrets are safe. Sister, he asks the wall of his quarters. Lately, in between bouts of euphoria, he's been sleeping too long. Sometimes it takes him an hour to get to his feet, and another hour to make himself don his armor. Wasn't living easy once? Couldn't he do things just by wanting to do them? The spark has gone out of him. The spark of the possibility of Mara's trust. He needs it back. Come home, 
the wall tells him. It's time to come home and take your crown. He leaps to his feet. Yes, he wants something again, wants more than to lie here numbly. He wants to show his face to his awoken people. He wants the fanfare played at his welcome. He wants to make a speech accepting the kingship. He wants to terrify and stir his people with the ferocity of his need to save Mara. The Awoken have survived so much, he will tell them that they do not need to survive anymore, that the end is coming, the end of the long plan. He goes to the catch's bridge. What news from the reef? He barks. A shank casts the sound into his ears. Petra's voice. Petra, who dares to try to replace what does not need replacing. Cade, the targets are in the crater now. My fire teams are in blocking position. Whoever you've got, call them in. Guardians. Petra and the Guardians working together? Did Mara ever want this? Aldrin thinks not. Is it possible that he's too late? That the Awoken are no longer Awoken? Lulled by the absence of his sister into the Traveler's trance? Set a course for the Vestian outpost, he snaps, rubbing at his eyes. Prepare skiffs for a camouflaged insertion. We will put an end to Petra- What are you doing? A captain of the Kings growls in his ear. The House of Kings is very satisfied with the state of the Awoken Domain. And if we interfere, we will suddenly attract guardians. Insubordination. She would have never tolerated this. Ah, Aldrin says, careful to keep his voice light. Yes, of course. The itch in his eyes resumes, and he discovers that he has a new desire. A new thing he fiercely wants. The Archon he saved is named Fikral, and he worships Aldrin like a father and a god. Aldrin understands now what brought them together. They each see a future for their broken people, a future that cannot be obtained by looking back. Fikral tells Aldrin how the Fallen have been crippled by their dependence on machines, how they have clung to tradition instead of hurling themselves into the abyss, seeking rebirth through extinction into a new species. I feel the same, Aldrin tells Fikral, whistling a tiny model galliot from an ingot of steel. We say we exist on the thin line between dark and light, Fikral, but my people have always been easily led astray. What future do you see for Awoken? Fikral asks him. What future? After he finds and saves Mara? He realizes that he doesn't care. He spent so many centuries stalking the perimeter of Awoken society, fighting off challengers, spying, sneaking, doing Mara's dirty work. Nothing has value except in its relation to Mara's plots. Not even himself. They can die for all I care, he says with a viciousness he never expected of himself. Didn't he want to save his people? No, no, Mara was willing to destroy them for her purposes. The Awoken have no value at all except in service of her design. If some part of them survives, it will be the worthy part. Does he wish for Awoken extinction? Is that what he truly wishes? We have work to do, he tells Fikral. The House of Kings has become... Uh, inconvenient to my plans. I wish to... He wags his knife. Divest. Fikral looks up sharply from his own knives. Dark ether seethes like mist around his face. It is time? We show them the future now? Honor us at the end gasps the former Kell of Kings. Faithless and false. Your sister's will kept us from the great machine, Aldrin Solve. She challenged the wolves by right of noble lineage. But you, you skulk in shadows and filth. You hide behind your bruises like a dreg. Funny you should mention that, Aldrin sneers. 
He knows he's sneering, but this worthless thing deserves it. What did the Kell of Kings ever want? To go backward. More servitors, more machines, more of the past. Aldrin sees now that extinction is only the beginning, that the bones of what you become can act more powerfully than the flesh of what you leave behind. Fickrel? Shattered servitors and dead fallen loom in ether frosted mounds behind Fickrel. He comes forward silently, hulking horrific, his headdress gridding out the firelight into blocks of shadow and smoke. He carries two shock daggers. We are the last of our kinds, Aldrin tells the Kel. My sister is gone. So is the idea of your great machine. The difference between us? He leans in to hiss. My sister's coming back. In four swift cuts, the Archon of the Scorned Barons docks the Kell of Kings. Aldrin tears the House of Kings sigil hanging from the new dreg's belt and holds it high for all to see. The Kings are dead. Long live the King, comes Fickrel's reverent growl. Less is more. Varric's watched Petra's Corsairs march their latest prize into the cell blocks, a gaggle of ether-starved dregs, bearing the mark of the scorned barons. Nearby, Petra drummed her fingers along the hilt of her knife, her eyes glint with envy. She held onto this prison as if it were the last thing she could control. Perhaps it was. Between the scattered remains of the Red Legion and the scorned barons running rampant through the reef, the Awoken had little left to call their own. There was little left of the Awoken. Varric sighed. Only a true Kel understood that survival was not a game of waiting, and Petrovenge, for all her military prowess, was no Kel. In a world without Kells, drag strength will breed nothing but chaos. Variks whispered to himself the old rain proverb, wishing for the return of the decisive days of his queen, his Kel. What did you say? Petra asked without looking at him. Chaos, he replied. These dregs breed chaos. Petra scoffed. They're fallen, and where there's fallen, there will inevitably be guardians. She turned on her heel and walked away. I leave you to your judgment, Varix. Locate the hole in which these scorned barons cower. She stopped, turned back to him. Might want to up your rations. You're looking a bit... gaunt. She smiled patted him on the back, and continued on her way. He watched her go. If his anatomy allowed for it, he would have smiled in kind. Hers was always a heart in the right place, even if the outcome of her decisions was less than ideal. She did not, however, fully appreciate the threat these scorned barons posed. He had tried to warn her when they were just seven dregs and a heretical archon. Now they were terror spreading throughout the reef, with more and more fallen answering the barons' anarchistic call. She was right about one thing, though. He could stand to increase his intake. The thought of it made Varric's thirst for the flow. Like all his kind since the appearance of the Red Legion, he had been forced to ration his intake. He'd never felt so weak, so close to death. But he survived as he always had. Varric knew the time would inevitably come when he would have to survive on his own. Nitrogen. Lightning, Koro yells, waking Telia Ross from an uneasy sleep. It's lightning, at last, at last! He has gone out in a cloak and rebreather to dance in joy. White light flashes through the film of Koro's plastic hovel. Telia thinks of art grenades and the barren scorn cutting through the walls of her lab. She shudders, counts the arrows in her quiver, and tries to go back to sleep. She can't. She puts on bow and quiver, and joins Koro outside. He's sifting the lightning-struck earth, grinning like a fool. A burrowing insect slips between his fingers. He pinches after it, but only gets one slim antenna. I need nitrogen to grow plants, he explains, pointing up to the sky and the mist that contained air that surrounds this part of the reef. When the containment field builds up enough charge, it arcs to the ground and the lightning bolts split nitrogen into the air, which fertilizes the soil. 
Isn't that amazing? Ter Telia stares at him. You can't seriously want to farm here. Home, civilized proper home, is a sealed habitat. A cool, clean place full of light. Why not? We're a refugee people now, Telia. You think things are going to get better? He points to the bright stars of habitats and ships above. All those? Those are targets. We have to learn to live off of our land. We're a refugee people because things keep killing us. Telia leaves angry boot prints in the soil. You won't have to be out here long. Petra Vinge will lock down the reef, or the queen will come back, or... or... You really think she survived? Koro brushes his hands clean. My Felda sure didn't, and she was tough. Real tough. It took legions of guardians to kill Oryx. The queen? She's... I know she was something special, but she's no guardian. I think I can still feel her, Telia says stubbornly. Sometimes. Sometimes. Who knows what can get into our heads these days. A new star ignites overhead. Korra squints. Guardianship, he says. You can tell by the way they come in, just like they don't have a care. Maybe they'll come hunt the scorn. Maybe one day Telia will be a scientist again in a proper lab with a proper place to sleep. Like the days after Skolos. I've got other hopes, Koro slaps his thighs, bound to his feet, and, as if he is a true prophet, heads for his hovel just a moment before his baby burst out crying. You hear about that one fallen on Hygieia? He pays for people willing to maintain a few remote telescopes. You work for the spider? Tella cries, but he's willing to pay in hard goods, willing to help people move, even willing to provide security. Koro pulls black his hovel's flap. Want to help me with the kids? Someone's got to explain why they shouldn't be afraid of lightning. Refusal. Petra has her welcome for Zavala all planned out. He will say something stentorian, which, while it's technically a greeting, Petra will also read as a reproach, or condescension, or perhaps paternal concern. Petra will smirk at Zavala like she really doesn't care, so that he knows he's nobody. A little guy. A bureaucrat. Far beneath her anger. But at this exact moment, a shard of cyanide-laced ice from the far reaches of the Oort cloud will penetrate the reef's ravaged defenses and smash into Zavala with such velocity that it becomes a thin ozone across the floor. A scum. When Zavala's ghost begins to rebuild him, Petra will say smoothly, No, allow me, and then she will brandish him up. The hatch opens. Cade Six backs his way through, talking to Zavala. Whatever you've seen, whatever you read, it's worse. These people need our... Cade. Petra half-consciously adopts Mara's fey remove, her insouciant and remote posture. Her throat jams up, and she actually coughs aloud against a sudden grief. You brought... Zvala grinds his way into the room, an obelisk of city stone extruded across the solar system to invade Petra's space. He very politely answers Cade before turning to her. The fact is, Cade, the queen did us a favor by leaving the reef in chaos. As long as the fallen are here killing each other, we have room to rebuild. Now he nods to Petra. Regent Commander, pleased to see you well. Likewise, I'm sure. Petra feels in her heart that the queen saw the reef as a protector of Earth and its people, if perhaps not protector of the Traveler. It still kills her to hear Zavala speak openly of the reef as a distraction. Cade has a proposal, she says, that he wanted us both to hear. Yes, I did. Cade prances between them like a flare meant to draw off heat-seeking fury passing between Petra and Zavala. The city's fall drove him deep into his gesture persona. Devil may care and fancy free, he has never quite recovered. It is like this, Petra. We're bringing a lot of Earth's lonely people into the arms of the city. I got to talking to Varix about the situation out here, and I figured, hey, maybe it's time we extend that policy to you. He sobers. I want to invite the Reef Awoken into the city. Abandon this place to Varix, to dead orbit, whoever wants it. It's hell out here, Petra. You won't survive. Zavala's eyes are locked on Petra. He burns with a magnificent stentorian power. 
Does the Regent Commander have enough control over the reef to ex execute a withdrawal? Despite your best efforts, Petra snapped. And then suddenly she cannot stop. She is too furious, too hot with grief. At least Cade is honorable enough to acknowledge what you've done to us. Every fallen house you shatter washes up on our shores. Every hive god and cabal tyrant you attract goes through us to get to you. No wonder she couldn't stand the sight of you, Zavala. You've forsaken your people. She bites back the rest. How she wishes that back in 2000 and whatever, when the darkness hurled mankind off the height of its golden age to plummet 16 centuries into barbarism, it had done just a slightly better job. That's not true. That's her broken heart talking. But oh, does it talk loud. She was a charlatan, Zavala says quietly. Fighting a war that existed only in her mind. Dragging you all behind her. Any of you who will admit that are welcome in my city. But I will not take in whatever conspiracy she is left unfinished. If you come to us, you come to join the city. No, no. Stop being the queen's people? Stop remembering her promise? You're afraid, Petra tells the Titan of Titans. And that's why she could never trust you. Go back to your travelers, Zavala. Thank you for your concern, Cade, but the reef has its own purposes, and you would mourn your foolishness if we would abandon them. Petra. They are the purposes, she snarled, intended by our queen. Fleet. They lock onto his ship, so far out that he actually grunts aloud in shock. But they have seen stealth tech in action before, among the fallen and against orcs, so he should not be surprised. The message comes, state your business, or be fired upon by orders of the regent commander. Arak Jalal chuckles at the title. He remembers Petra's time in the tower. Her simmering impatience to be back out in the black sky. She got her wish. Perhaps she regrets it. She was right about one thing, at least. This is where everything that matters happens. If Dead Orbit had ruled the city, there would have been a fleet to meet Gaul. It's a rock Jalal of Dead Orbit, he says cheerfully. I'm here to speak with Region Commander Petra, Vinge. I am not an emissary for the city. I come on my own accord to the scatters matters of fleet. Jalal had been to the reef before, but never through proper channels. He's a little surprised when Petra Vinge meets him at the transmat zone. He expected an escort to a waiting area, where he'd be given a sense he's not a priority. However, Petra is an operative, not a politician. She can't bear to delay action for the sake of theater. He likes that. A rock Jalal, she shakes his hand firmly. Does he feel a whisper of some faint telekinetic force against his throat? She can do that knife trick, and what else? Welcome back to your ancestors' home. Regent Commander. How does the rule suit you? A reminder that they are both out of place. It's temporary. She beckons him to walk. You want to discuss ships? We have talented labor, but no safeguards for them to do their work. If you supply a site, he checks her with a slash of his hand. A spacewalker's gesture. I came for salvage rights. Salvage? Around Saturn. I want your permission to go through the debris swarm for materials and space frames. The dead will, of course, be returned. Petra is silent. A rock expects her, being a spacer, to be a pragmatist, to see the reef doesn't have to spare capacity to process the salvage, and the inner solar system needs as many ships as it can raise. There is also the question of Oryx's weapon and whether it can be defeated in the dreadnought ever stirs again. But Petra remains silent. The wounds are still too fresh. I apologize. It seems a shame to leave those resources for the fallen, or to drift into Saturn. She speaks. Earthborn, do you mourn for her? He thinks she will know if he lies. I respected her, yes, but I despise the way she seemed entitled to all of us. I never regret choosing the path I did. I was awoken to continue the search we started long ago, the quest for worlds worthy of our lives. Petra turns her back and goes. He stares after her. Only after a long minute does he understand. She cannot say any of the things she wants to say and cannot bring herself to tell the lies she should. 
So she refuses him. She refuses the choice. Jalal pities her a little. She will never be free of her. Of Earth and the Reef Dear Master Ives, I write to you on behalf of the Cryptarchs of Earth in sympathy for all those who died in service to your queen. We Earthborn feel your loss and hope this tragedy will usher in a new era. We have made great strides in unraveling a richer and deeper history of Earth and its colonies, a history buried below merely ordinary truths. This content is, of course, far too sensitive to publish generally. We long feared that if it were intercepted by Her Majesty your Queen, it would be denied or manipulated to serve some need of her own. Some of these discoveries relate to the nature of our awakening, while others point to the occurrence of journeys like our own. Journeys that may have had troubling results. All of the scholarship would benefit from cross-reference and critical comparison with your own collected records. We hope you agree that this knowledge is far more important than any schism that once defined our peoples. We look forward to cooperation between our libraries, correspondence between our scholars, and the beginning of a new intellectual golden age, a time of lucidity and truth. Respectfully, Master Rahul. Dear Master Rahul, We, the Cryptarchs of the Reef, appreciate your sympathy for the devastation that our people suffered in your defense. We likewise express our sorrow for your recent losses and, of course, apologize for the length of time it has taken us to respond to your request. We were determined to give our reply the full deliberation it deserved. It is our unanimous consensus that you are a vile, sir, that you are a grasping wretch, and that you would attempt to use our misfortune to solicit access to our vaults and records, which I assure you are far more extraordinary than whatever half-eaten corruptions you've discovered among your ruins is quite appalling. We will, however, happily review any data or records you believe would be of interest to our efforts. You'll also be curious to know that reams of new discoveries are being generated daily since your traveler cast out the last of its light to refuel your guardians. Let us hope you are wise enough to understand its message. With all the respect that is due, Master Ives. Pilgrimage. Zavala lowers his brow to the Ionian earth. It feels like the respectful thing to do. There's a big, coiled ammonite fossil right under the thin topsoil, though, and he knocks his forehead on it. The pain and the blowing sulfur dust make him sneeze. Humbly I come, he says, almost laughing, to speak to thee. Ikora said this was the place. Io, a world still half-born, connected as if by an untorn umbilical to the traveler. I wanted to say, thank you. He finds he's looking up at Jupiter. He's accustomed to seeing the traveler above the city, so he fastens on the nearest huge floating sphere as a proxy. He forces his eyes down to the soil again. Thank you for what you did to Gaul. Ikora tells him if you listen with the right ears, you can hear the traveler's last conversation with Io as if the matter of terraforming an entire moon with Earth-like gravity and biosphere is only a matter of rhetoric and instruction. Well, isn't that the challenge in the end? Not just assembling the power to do something, but convincing people to do it. No, not even that. Not convincing or coercing. And Traveler knows he's tempted sometimes. But teaching them how to think as you think, how to value what you value, even giving them the ethics required to understand your valuation. So that you can trust them to make the choices you would, even when you're not around to father them. Zavala wishes he were half as good a teacher as he is a titan. Then maybe he could allow himself to relax a little and let others take care of things. Except last time he let his guard down. Last time he dared to think they were triumphant. With orcs repelled, Siva contained, Vex befuddled, Cabal huddled in their bunkers and too stubborn to come out, Gaul turned up in a storm and nearly destroyed the city, the Traveler, and everything Zavala loves. Did I fail you? he asked the bone-coiled dirt. Am I the reason you had to wake up? Because I couldn't stop Gaul by myself? 
In the giddiness of victory, he declared this the new golden age, but now he thinks he may have misunderstood the traveler's awakening. He has always, he hopes, been a brave man, but he is almost too afraid to ask the next question. Is this just our next age of triumph? Is something worse on the way? The bruise where he headbutted the fossil throbs. History, Zavala once told someone, is a question of armor. How much can you survive and keep on living? More than this, more than what's hit them so far. But how much more? And if the next escalation is a consequence of the Traveler's awakening, will it be Zavala's fault? Duty is a puzzle. The harder you work, the more it seems to weigh. That reminds Zavala of Basho, his favorite poet, and the hot springs Basho once visited to see the murder stone, which killed birds and insects that came too near. He has a horrible idea of the Traveler as that stone, surrounded by buzzing flies, all shaped like ghosts. You're doing it again, his ghost warns him. I know that expression. I know, Zavala says. I just worry. <laughs> Roll call. After the Taken War, the Scorned Barons banded together in a time of weakness to become strong to prey on anyone and anything that practiced the old Elixni ways. They began with the one thing their people needed to survive, ether. In a way, the barons had become heads of a new house, priests in their own rights and arbiters of their own trials. The terror they unleashed had almost grown as powerful as any Kel. These heathens were not Elixni. They were more fallen than any of their brethren. They were everything Judgment had sought to purge before the whirlwind, and now they sat rotting deep in the prison of elders. Cade and his six had done good by their word. Varric's staff tapped lightly on the floor plates, and chuckling noises emitted from his throat. He hobbled past their cells as the servitors hummed to life. Feeding time. He saw hatred in every cell he passed. Bathed in the light of flowing ether, their eyes carved at his flesh, saw him docked a thousand times more. Yavix, the rider, the untamed, she and her crew spread terror and disease with their noxious pikes. Elkris, the machinist, she used stolen cabal telemetry and gravity traps to sabotage vessels, relieve them of their cargo, and haul the hulks back to their own shipyard chop shops. Pirha, the blind, the ghost of Hellrise Cavern, who haunted the Baron's territory with phantom decoys and ended all trespassers from the shadows. Rekis Vaughn, the Godslayer, the Hangman. He had secreted away the ether stores of his victims and driven the Barons and their followers into a frenzy with that tainted feast. Araxes, the Wit, the Traitor, the Trickster, a mastermind, a liar, thief, and backstabber. Canix Twofinger, the Mad Bomber, the dangers of the reef had multiplied a hundredfold with his mines hidden on every rock and dusty corner of the belt. And the most disgusting of them all, Hyrax, the mind bender. This one found in the hive a way to infect the minds of the Elixir. Only one was missing, Fickrel, the heretic, the fanatic, one Varix once dared to call friend back when the Archon tended to Kallax's primes, before his betrayal. He hoped the fanatic was dead. Cade assured that he was. And what was Cade's six if not reliable? <laughs> Laughing, burbling to himself, Varric shut off the lights in the hallway, and the barons were plunged once again into darkness. After that, Aldrin and Fickrel part ways. For a time. Fickrel goes to his bloody work, reshaping fallen society the way a hammer reshapes a spider and drawing certain useful elements to him. Aldrin resumes his lonely search for Mara. He remembers a time long ago. Scouting with the crows, scouting with a young corsair who wanted nothing more than to be defined by her wrath. Perhaps Petra can be saved too. He finds her in Thieves' Landing. What is she doing here? Mara never would have stooped to this. Trading information with a criminal in the lowest places of... 
So few of us remain, he tells her, and in that moment, seeing the shame in her, he knows she is too far gone. She cannot be saved. That night, he weeps for Petra. Mara comes to him in the darkness. She has heard his sorrow. He looks up in wonder, his sister sending her will and wisdom to watch over him. He knows then that it will be all right. Flayed. Spider's lair. Petra in her element, light-footed, light of thought. She keeps herself open to the place. Heat of packed bodies and machinery. Bite of ether in the air. Money in the promise of money and the things that money can make people do. And knives, pistols, danger like static charge. He's no good for you, she says, and he's no good for me. If you turn him over, I'll be happy. You like me happy, don't you, spider? The spider grumbles very well. You will take him alive? He must have stores of ether, and no matter what Beric says, that ether is mine. He's agreed. She has what she came for, which is proof that the spider actually wants this capture to succeed. As regent, she can never tell which she succeeds. She's constantly reacting, making decisions that will only be clearly assessed by historians. Here, she is the wrath again. She feels brave. We'll deal with the ether once we have him. Thank you for the information. Petra slides the hood over her head and dismisses herself back into the crowd. Two dregs barter salvage with token-like fingernails-sized knives. Slatted light falls through thick clouds of adulterated ether to cut hard lines across the torn bannerless fringes of some fallen ware. A cabal deserter, hunched against the wall in a baggy pressure sack, sells the location of Red Legion arms caches for loads of raw glimmer. Petra pauses for a moment on the threshold, looks back longingly and at the chaos within, and wishes that anything would happen to make her stay. She goes out into the shadows of the surface. Soon, as clear as the visions that sometimes come to her, she knows there's something moving quick and stealthily up ahead. She keeps her pace steady, checks her knife and pistol. So few of us remain, Petrovinge. The voice betrays a bearing, and she catches just a glimpse of structure against the background noise, a hood of a cloak, the arc of lips. Who's there? she challenges. It's a man. His moves are erratic, shrouded in a rhythmic noise that mimics the chaos of nature. He knows how to seem like an accidental thing, a tumbled heap, a brush of wind. Petra. If only we could go back to those days before... Aldrin? she gasped. He is here. He has come to take the regency and execute his sister's will. She will be free again to act. Act without cruel deliberation and agonizing uncertainty, free to meet every challenge instead of making them for herself. No, this must be an illusion. It's too much of everything she wants. She searches with senses beyond sight for something capable of casting this into her mind. A scion player? A hive wizard? She trusted you with all of this. All of us. And you gave it to the mercy of the light. She feels the intent to murder, and she knows it is meant for her. She draws and acquires the target faster than sound can cross the mind to tongue, but her sight picture captures only darkness. Two slow heartbeats. When no shot or knife comes, she begins to withdraw. Nothing follows her to her ship. Jensen Scribe Asher Muir stands looking at himself in a mirror. He is shirtless. With a hand that still feels, he reaches to the shoulder that doesn't feel. He taps his fingernails against the rigid metal there, then taps his way to his clavicle. The boundary between metal and skin is neither uniform nor tidy. Metal gives way to a sheath of hard, keratinized skin that puckers and blooms and splits like he is a snake, slopping its skin. Keratinized skin gives way to toughened, calloused, ugly, with bruising and overstressed veins. He spreads his palm against his chest and holds it there, as if covering it up will make it go away. Then, with effort, he drops his hand and forces himself to look for a long time. What will happen, he wonders, when the machino forming reaches his lungs? 
It's already painful to cough. You should go to the reef. Asher sucks in a breath through his teeth, and he snatches at his shirt. He struggles to put it on, then whirls around to find Ikora Ray leaning against his doorway. Unforgivable intrusion, he spits. Declare yourself plainly when you approach, and schedule your so-called visits in advance. I was not expecting you. Ikora exchanges a brief glance with Ophiacus, then goes on. Tyra believes that Ives or another one of the Reef Cryptarchs might be able to help. A fool's errand. The Cryptarchs are preoccupied with idle theory. The answer to my problem lies here, with the Vex. If that's so, why didn't you come with me to see Osiris? Asher fights his way into his robes, fastening snaps and ties so quickly that he misaligns several. Because he is a useless, self-obsessed wretch. Ikora raises an eyebrow and waits. Asher sneers as he smooths back both hands across his belly, trying to tidy his silhouette. I concede your point, but I do not have to acknowledge it. The Techians, then. My hidden say Ashen stiffens. His head snaps up. Your hiddens? He barks as hot tears well in his eyes. Your hidden knew nothing about this illness. The Queen's witches, if they still live, know nothing about this illness. No one can stop it. I'm beginning to believe there is no sense in even trying. Exegesis As I have made it my life's work to seek as much truth as history can offer, I chronicle these dreams and hope that my subjective understanding might provide some path for truth to others. Infinite Sadness I stand at the bow of the ship, crying as the stars streak the skies. I am trying to chronicle trillions of star systems at once, searching for a single planet. A faceless companion asks why I look so sad. And I show her a photo of a globular mass or a dual-ringed planet, depending on how you hold it. How much did you pay for that? she asked. Everything I have, I respond. Then the stars stop streaking and the ship crumbles apart. We fall into nothing, and I awake. Fissuring warmth. I am running from an encroaching burn of blue light. I jump from rock to rock, as they are the only things with gravity. Every leap is a battle against the cold nothingness of space. I see a sea of people gather together, and realize that's where I'm trying to go to. I make one more giant leap, but the blue burn catches my ankles and I fall. The impact of my plummet shatters the rock in two. Hundreds of these beings fall into the chasm I create behind me. I try to heave each of them back to the surface, and I do until I can't anymore. My elbows won't bend, my arms are too weak to push. The descent gets warmer and warmer until all goes black and I awake. Songs of Analysis I am outside of my body, watching it float from the shapeless void into another. The first void contains a voice humming a tune, yet no presence. As I pass through each, one by one, another voice joins in harmony. I try counting the voices, but I am not sure I should be adding or subtracting as they fade into one. And in my confusion, I lose any memory of numbers at all. I feel a tether pull me back into being and see myself waving goodbye. A voice burrows into my mind as the serenading songs become discordant, ugly. The voice becomes louder, and I awake. Washing skin. I have gathered my belongings into gray porcelain sink. The soap clings to my fingers. As I wash what I possess, my things begin to dissolve. I scrub harder because I know that the washing is a way to remove impurity, and I must be certain that I will not dissolve too. My mother tells me, that silver is the element of false life, blue skin poison. I worry that my fingernails are soft. Mountain. I am on the mountain at Phil Winter's Peak, except there is an express monorail to my neighborhood grocery in the city, which is all out of what I need. A guardian brings me a special engram. I refuse to decrypt it. I tell the guardian it is better this way unactualized secret certainly containing the thing that will be needed when the moment comes. Tyra. I am someone else. I hope someday I will meet Tyra Karn. 
job undone. In the prison of Elder's security hub, Varix brooded. When the great machine woke, he had been sure he felt something deep within him stir. He had hoped it would give him answers, power, anything. All it did was remind him of how far he had fallen. He slammed a fist on his console, watching the Denzians of the prison claw at their cell walls. No, not nothing. Worse than nothing. Now he had doubt. His goal had always ever been a simple one. The banner of house judgment. The calling to which he had been born. Keep his people together. With the light now streaming across the system and nothing to show for it. No queen, no heiress or Osiris, and no sign the great machine remembered the elixni. What was there to look forward to? Base survival. One day after the other. Living just because he still drew breath. And where was the dreg strength in that? What was the... Verex. Petra burst through the comms. A Legion Harvester has been intercepted at bearing 189. Capture teams are inbound. Survivors for the arena. Prepare to receive. Petrovenge was all that was left for him here. And despite himself, he nodded at the sound of her voice. He had but one ally left, after all. He keyed the comms. Yes, yes, yes. Bay 41. Bring them in. We'll meet team. We'll make room for new guests. His vocal synth burbled, needing tuning. Copy that. She was gone. He picked up his staff from where it leaned against the wall and began the long walk to the bay, mulling his options, his information, his secrets. Secrets had protected the House of Judgment. The more knowledge one could obfuscate, the more significant one became. Secrets bred possibility. Secrets bred sway. But judgment, true judgment, required hierarchy. And Elixni hierarchy died with the fall of the houses. The guardians had picked them apart, kel by kel, prime by prime. Now there was all but nothing left of his culture. Only pirates and scavengers and lone wolves like the days before the Edge Wars. No trust, no honor, no way to be necessary. Yet one final hope among the Elixni still thrived. Crass, Kel of Kings. The Kings understood judgment, for together they ended the Edge Wars in their people's golden age. Crass, his last hope to see his dreams of a united Elixni made manifest. He must make contact. And so he hired a bounty hunter named Grox to find Krask and remind them of their need for one another. Grox is emblematic of all that Varix despises in his people. Gluttonous, proud, and in it for himself. When they spoke, Grox made Varix pay with a litany of insults. Varix the slip, Varix the beggar, Varix the cowmaker, but it was all for show. Grox would work, and it came for a mere four bales of etheric helix and a promise to keep him free of the prison of elders. The deal struck. Grox burst out in hysterical laughter. Ha! Ah, consider job done, Slip! Grox spoke in a low form of elixir, the only reason Varix employed him. You have grown desperate with your kel gone. Have you not heard? Varix sighed. King Kel is gone, Kel Maker. Dead at the hands of that insane Archon, Fikral, and some awoken vagabond he calls Father. What remains of the king huddles now in the dead zones of Earth under the shadow of the great machine Shard. I expect my four bales and... Varix killed the feed. The last link in the great Elixni chain was broken. If there was any who called themselves Kel out there, they would not know Varix, Judgment, or the laws that govern the houses. The scattered children of the whirlwind were dead. But Fickrell survived Cade and his six? Grox was a lot of things, but he was not a liar. If Fikril was alive and strong enough to kill Krask, and who was this awoken vagabond of which Grok spoke? His mind reeled. So long as Fikril lived, the reef was not safe. He scrambled through his comm channels, searching for the right connection. Master Cade, Varex requests to meet you regarding your deal with Petra. A job undone. Some kind of luck. Varix hid beneath a bannerless cloak as he descended into Spider's lair. To wear the Judgment Sigil in the Tangled Shore would be to invite death. Even with the Spider's blessing to pass, he would have been picked clean and docked two times over. The hedonistic sounds of Spider's palace scrapped against him. 
Shouts of victory and defeat reminded Variks of the worst of the Elixni. His people's inherent need for superiority reduced to gambling for trinkets and gems. Variks searched the crowd, hunched down low, just another vandal, in the corner, the unmistakable crowd that surrounded the hunter vanguard when he was outside the city. He worked his way through the onlookers to take up position alongside Kate. The hunter noticed him, he was sure, but said nothing. Variks, for his part, was silent, watched as he lost a few thousand glimmer and a sidearm to one of Spider's bodyguards. Cade spun a knife in his hand and sighed dramatically. If we're going to talk, you're going to buy me a drink. They found a quiet place at the end of the room. Cade settled back into the booth, waiting. You do great service to Reef, yes? Variks worked hard to keep his very recognizable voice down. It would be a shame for his vocal synth to malfunction and blare out across the room now. Capture barons, criminals for Awoken, for Petra. Kay took a belt and set the glass down on the table, empty, something hard around his eyes. Amazing how expressive Exos could be. <sighs> Get to the point, Varix. Thickrel, the last scorned baron. He lives. Cade's horn cut an arc through the air as he shook his head twice, definitive. Trust me, he's dead. Put a hot one right through here. He poked Varix right in the center of his chest. Seen on Earth. I have knowledge. I have information. You know Elixni have ways. Like Mithrax. Like Tanix. The warden realized his error as soon as the name was out of his mouth. Don't you ever mention the name Tanix around me. Got it? Not unless you want to lose your last two real arms. We're done. Get! You're bad luck. The hunter stood, made to leave. Varix reached out and grabbed the vanguard by the arm with one of his mechanical hands. I am sorry. I spoke poorly. Please, listen. Cade shrugged off the arm and stood, towering over the fallen for once. Varix sat up straighter in the booth. Take me to Zavala. The Titan Vanguard's name was a punctuated, flowing stutter in his mouth. I have information. He will like what I say. You for bringing me to him. Cade blinked. You want me to take you to the city? No way, Bug. Not in a million. With a thud, Varric dropped the hand cannon he'd been hiding in his cloak on the table. A dull brown, bristles out the top. Ether tech trigger and muzzle assembly. Cade's eyebrows went up in surprise. A gift of trust. Memento of the reef. Upgraded, yes. Very deadly. The hunter vanguard tried to hide his excitement. Is, uh, is that the last one? I haven't seen one of those in... One of the last. Not many left. Varric's voice was even. Calm. Cade snatched a weapon from the table. Checked the sights, spun it in his hand for a moment, feeling the weight. Grunted, satisfied, nodded. Like I said, bad luck. Come on, you can ride with me. <laughs> Overestimation. Variks had never seen the Vanguard commander in person before. The images he had seen were either candid shots from agents or images from co-opted surveillance that didn't reveal the man's true stature. Most of Zavala's bulk, he realized, was the armor. He was a lean man, in reality, taut muscle and sinew. But as Varric stood before him, he realized Zavala's poise and confidence, along with his light, controlled the space around him, lent him an air of authority Varric's had not felt since standing in the presence of Marasov herself. Even Cade, of all people, seem somehow different in the orbit of this man. Fascinating. Behind the light in the poise, Variks could see where the great Zavala's strength ended and anxiety began. That was where Variks needed to meet him and prove his worth. Vanguard Commander Zavala. Variks dropped to his knees and extended his hands, palms up on the ground, sure to keep eye contact. A judgment gesture meant to acknowledge that a dominant force was present. Cade snickered behind him, but said nothing. 
Varix came to offer assistance, to help the Vanguard, the Guardians who have helped the Reef. Zavala stared Varix down. The Judgment Scribe saw much in that moment. Fortitude, intensity, desperation. On your feet, Varix. Zavala was quite used to giving commands and having them followed. Varix did as he was commanded. What do you want? <laughs> A future for the Reef. Zavala's eyes were searching. Varix croaked and continued. Reefborn are close to doom. Zavala the Awoken. Fallen. Taken. Red Legion. All carve at the Reef. All claim its flesh. I made my offer to Petra after the war. His voice was gruff, but not uncaring. She made her choice. Are you saying something has changed? I say this, Commander, Varix burbled. And I have so much more to say to a true leader such as you. Admit it. Admit that you trapped my sister in the Dreaming City. I did not, Ilan says. She's not trapped, Aldrin. She's dead. Aldrin knows the truth now, and he wants things to be right. He wants it so fiercely that he knows nothing he does in pursuit of this want can be wrong. Witch lies. He spits venomous. She is alive. Ilan measures him in silence for a while. Then, we knew you would come, she tells him, with quiet, calm defiance. You're lost, Aldrin. You knew I'd come, but you never searched for me. My sister would take your eyes for that. Your sister needs nothing from us now, Aldrin. Not even you. The rage is almost enough to make him kill her, but he knows Mara wouldn't approve. She is with him now. She is substantial, if not corporeal, and she dances at the edge of his sight. You're so close, she whispers. Free me from this place, Aldrin Sov. You've gone mad, Helen says, with repulsive empathy. I almost did too when I knew she'd gone. Why do you travel with that thing? What have you come to do? I've come to finish it, Aldrin tells her. He even tries to smile, because he is being honest. He's telling the truth. I've realized I was a fool to try to surprise her. We all exist through her design, Ilan. We all act only by her consent. I'm going to save her, because she needs me to save her. When she needs me to die, I will die. And when she has completed her great design for the Awoken, the Awoken will die too. It is the reward we so richly deserve, for we owe everything to Mara. It would be wrong for us to outlive our purpose. Trust me, life without her is worse than... worse than... He chokes on it. He can't describe it. At the edge of sight, Mara watches him with all the heartbroken concern and tender care he has always wanted from her. That evening, he surrenders himself to the Reef. They take him in with a full strike team, and one of the snipers, joining Aldrin and his jailers at the extraction point, looks him full in the eyes, like he's asking a question. A tall man with a long rifle, narrow, intelligent eyes, handsome. Is he... did Aldrin want something from him once? Something important? Aldrin absently rubs his eyes as he stares at him. He frowns, but he can't figure it out. They take him to a discreet landing dock on one of the lower levels of the Prison of Elders. When his containment unit hisses open, the glow and the mist silhouette an exo with glowing blue eyes and a woman with her weapon drawn, Petra herself. She stands there in silence. He knows she wants to kill him, he knows she wishes him to say, You've done well. She speaks to you. 
Her words are curt and direct. What does she say? Aldrin closes his eyes and lets Mara's voice wash through him. He is here, in the heart of Petra's strength, in the prison she has so carefully tended as everything else falls apart. He is weak and he is bound. These are the strengths his sister never possessed. The endurance of humiliation, the survival of defeat. She says, he lifts his head to meet her gaze and watches her flinch. She holds him in her weapon's sights as she withdraws, step by careful step. The Exo steps forward to hood him with a black bag. She says, free me. Unknown space. The light seemed to dance in blue over the horizon of unknown space, but all else was black. Tendrils seemed to grow with the light. Where they were reaching from or stretching towards, he could not comprehend. Fear gripped Varric's mind. The paths before him were vast, uncertain, and for the first time in his life, he could sense judgment turned inward. Your will must remain your own, he told himself. You are the last elixir of house judgment. The destiny of your people is in your hands. You will save them. You will stand for the fallen. You walk among them because, because you have failed. The voice, soft and yet so strong, echoed around him in the space, through him, like he was a string on an instrument. I walk among the children of Earth and the blessed of the great machine, the one they call Traveler because they have been chosen. For you, the great machine is a dark mirror. Varix felt cold unlike he had ever known. Unbidden, memories rushed past him. All he could do was hang on as the last days of the elixir played out in his mind. He and his fellow scribes passing judgment in their soft, furred robes. Then the whirlwind, the elders torn apart, the pillaging of the house, Varric's kneeling before a window, staring up at the great machine, watching it vanish, the long journey in the dark. His flight to run with the wolves, his pleas to Skolas, the pact with Fickrel to serve Kallax Prime and secret it away, the Prime vanishing, and again Fickrel on the horizon, preparing to give the Fallen what they so rightly deserve. There is only one path left for you here, in a place where everything dies. With that, a new power burned, affording him the strength to rise again. Judgment cat. <laughs> the screaming pulse of the prison alarm stirred Varric's awake. On the comms, he heard Petra's voice. Kate had returned. Two cells. Petra called for not one, but two cells. Varric's finished his ether, considering. Perhaps Cade had finally found Fickrel. And for that, Varix would need every drop of strength he could muster. His strides were long and slow as he allowed the ether to course through him, his posture growing taller and more commanding with each step. At the top of the Maxsec wing, his hands flew over the controls. He prepared the two empty cells and ordered extraction servitors into place, all the while reveling in the thought of the judgment of Fickrel. Finished, he stepped back and waited. Snarling, yelling, the prisoners entered the wing, one, in Elixni, Petra shoved hard into one of the two cryo cells. The Fallen landed, weak, and Petra sealed the cell door. Varix was all too pleased to see the hulking, disgraced Fickrel, the lifeline of the scorned barons, his once trusted co-conspirator and great betrayer. Seething as the extraction servitors whirred to life, sapping the heretical archon of his precious ether, Varix and Fickrel looked deep into one another's eyes. Centuries of history passed between them in the space of a heartbeat. Fickrel laughed. <laughs> Unnerved, Varric stepped away as Cade dragged a ragged, humanoid figure, head bagged, face unseen. Cade unceremoniously tore off the hood and tossed the humanoid, an awoken man, into the open cell. And stay there, Cade said. His joke fell flat. On hands and knees, the stranger looked up at his captors to reveal a familiar mess of crow black hair, blue skin, and piercing yellow eyes. Varix, 
It was the face of Aldrin Solve, brother to the Queen, Prince of the Awoken, and heir to the Reef. Re-acquaintance. Your Grace. Varix couldn't help but use the title, like a reflex. As he looked into the prince's eyes, he saw a fleeting shadow of darkness dance across their normal ethereal golden glow. Varix looked back to Petra. Petra, Benj, I... I do not understand. I know. It's... Something's wrong with him, Varix. He's mad. Lock him down. Lock down the entire cell block. No one in but you or me. Speak of this to no one. As far as the system is concerned, Aldrin Sov died over Saturn. Varix looked to Cade for answers, but the Exo just threw up his hands in defense. Don't look at me! Prince Whinyface and Fickrel were thick as thieves when we found them. All I could do not to shoot either of them. Petra nodded towards the now royal cell, and Varix, with only a hint of hesitation, sealed the hatch, locking Prince Aldrin in. Now, Varix, Cade said, smooth as ever, you let me know if Fickrel ever comes up to the arena. He and I have a conversation to finish. Of course, of course. Varix noticed Petra's gaze lingered a little too long on the prince's cell. He could see she was troubled, even ashamed. Petra saw him watching and composed herself. Back straight, all wrath. She met his eyes. He could see her trouble, her shame. Varix, my friend. Was that tenderness Varix heard in Petra's voice? He is changed. His eyes... She stopped herself, reset. If he speaks, don't listen. He speaks lies. Terrible lies. And with that, she walked away. Cade close behind. The doors to the cell block slam shut behind them. Varric stood there for a long, long time. For the first time in his life, he didn't know what the next step should be. Petra Venge and Aldrin Solve had long admired one another. There was an easiness about them when they were together, and a deep, if unspoken, affection. When the two of them joined forces in the field of battle, they were quick, effective, and dangerous. There was a dance of death and woe to the foe who met them in open combat. Varix wondered for what crimes Petra would have Aldrin judged. As he reopened the prince's cell, he wondered if Petra would have Varix himself judged. Varix knelt before Aldrin. We thought you dead, but you are in my care now. Yes. His arms carefully brushed at the awoken man, probing but gentle. Aldrin blinked and looked toward him, or rather his golden eyes looked beyond him. Varix looked over his shoulder, just to check. Of course no one was there. Sister? Aldrin croaked through dried, cracked lips. What is to become of us now? Revolution. The explosion of servitors snapped Varix away from the pull of the prince's words. He tried to move quickly, but one of his toes caught awkwardly on the grated catwalk, and he stumbled to the floor. He lifted his head to see the extraction servitors laying shattered and lifeless, hissing as ether evaporate wafted into the air. Varix rose, moving cautiously, slowly, uncertain who or what might be loose. He checked every seal of Fickrel's cell, then gathered enough courage to peer into the porthole. Fickrel was unaffected. If anything, he looked stronger than he did before. He stood there, glaring, a devilish grin plastered across his face. Does it find my ether bitter? He growled. Indeed, Varys could see that something was wrong with this ether. It was darker, tainted with something he could not identify. He tightened the seals of his mask as he examined the servitor's remains, fearing whatever they pulled from Fickrel could be toxic. He moved through the fog-like gas as if it was water. It didn't dissipate like traditional ether. It lingered, heavy and opaque. Varric stepped back up to Fickrel's cell, activated the transmission mic. Fickrel, Alassi Akisarix, he seethed, using the high speak of judgment, hoping that Fickrel might still respect the oldest law. Ah, uh, Varric, 
You cling to judgment like rain clung to lies. Thickerel spat his words the way the houseless would. You are houseless. You are filth. Is this what you've done to Calix? Serve the last prime to the Taken? Is that the blood you now breathe? Oh, you still believe I have Calix? Fool! Calix abandoned us! But my ether, its true fickle, is no longer enslaved to the machine's ether. By the grace of the Awoken Father, I have evolved. Varix looked back to the prince's cell, still open. The Awoken Father. Varix ambled back to the prince. With each step he heard more clearly. He saw Aldrin sitting up now, nodding, listening, peering into the shadows at something unseen. If ever there was a picture of malevolent insanity, this was it. The prince spoke. Yes, sister, I see now. The army of the reviled that you promised me. <laughs> the spark. Varix, ever the loyal, did as Petra commanded. Access to the lowest cell block was reserved strictly to the warden and the regent commander. Unfortunately, this meant that every menial operational task was left to him. Meal distribution, waste disposal. Between the eight barons and the Awoken Prince, his new chores left him with little time for judgment. Thrice per day, he visited the block, and thrice per day, he had to manufacture excuses to the local Corsair detachment for why the lowest level of the prison was now off limits. Rumors swirled. It was not unknown that Petra and Cade Six had smuggled some unknown high-value prisoner, a humanoid prisoner no less, a first for the prison of elders if the rumors were true. But Varric assured anyone with the gumption to ask that his judgment of the scorned barons was a sensitive process to be conducted in private. Petra herself did not help extinguish the scuttle. She was less than adept at the art of secrecy, and everyone knew it. She responded to any bold queries with a stern, It's none of your concern, which itself was tantamount to a validation that some version of the rumors were true. If only she'd found joy in her Techian training. If only she'd learned more from the queen. Each time Varix performed his rounds, he asked himself what loyalty, if any, he owed to the prince. And each time he stopped short when he bore witness to the prince's ramblings. Today was no different. There sat Aldrin, elbows atop knees, staring into the same dark corner of the cell, face concealed by his long, black hair, seemingly communing with nothing. I see now. Yes, that's good. So good. More listening, more nodding. Then that is what we shall do. And look, sister, he is already here. Aldrin fell into silence, visibly relaxing. After a moment, he looked back over his shoulder and through the porthole to meet Varric's eyes. <laughs> Your grace, Varric burbled. Varric the loyal, Aldrin smirked. Varric the spark, did you have something to say to me, or are you content to play the spying crow? And there it was, again that fleeting pass of inky darkness that momentarily snuffs the glow of Aldrin's eyes. So Varric said nothing. Whether frozen in terror or simply at a loss for words, he could not say. Aldrin leaned in, placed a finger against his lips, and spoke low. I have a secret for you, Varric. I know you want to hear it. Varric answered with a single, drawn-out, and ever-so-slight nod. Your Kel lives. Aldrin whispered. He leaned in a little closer and asked the one question Varix had never been able to answer. Do you know where your true loyalty lies, Varix? Aldrin didn't wait for a response. His eyes almost immediately darted over his shoulder towards the shadowy corner that had become his obsession. Of course we can trust him, dear sister. He is most loyal. Chain of Souls. Varix admired his masterpiece, 
the improvised servitor chain that would finally reveal the secrets of his fanatical former friend. Unfortunately, Fickrell refused to talk of the past, would speak only of the future, or of Aldrin, his awoken father, who snatched him from the edge of death and awakened within him a power never seen before in the Elixni. A power over death itself. A power to remake their people and thrive in a universe of light and dark that had both forsaken them and left them scorned. Variks knew these feelings all too well. It was here, in the deepest catacombs of the Prison of Elders, where he thrived, where he worked to rebuild the Elixni. This was his home now, this workspace where he was free to explore the potential of the prison's inmates for future leverage. The emerald marrow worm, food of the hive, the prismatic viruses of the Vex, Scion Flare wavelengths. Each of these secrets had been wrested free within these dank halls, traded among his networks for more secrets or harnessed into weapons for the Awoken. But the secrets of Fickrell's mutation eluded him. The power within was obvious. Scattered about the floor was evidence of its potency. As well as too many nights of failure. Wrecked sentry servitors, dozens of deflated dregs, all pulled from the upper cell blocks to act as his assistance. Whatever this cold, unnatural cocktail was that coursed through Fickrell, it could not be transferred or ingested like the ether his people needed to sustain their wretched lives. Variks was all too ready to give up. Send Fickrell into the arena to face Cage 6 and put an end to the legacy of the Scorn Barons. Until one day, during Variks' rounds, Aldrin spoke to him unprompted. There was a lucidity in the discarded prince's eyes, a clarity that didn't exist even before he disappeared over Saturn's rings. Aldrin gave Variks a fresh perspective. And so, the chain. It was a dangerous gamble, mingling Fickrell's polluted lifeblood with traditional ether. These servitors held 70% of Varix's own ether reserves. If this failed, well, it wouldn't be the first time Varix had risked everything and lost. Varix pulled the lever. The hum of the servitor chain crescendoed, but all he heard was the lingering echo of Aldrin's poisonous question. Do you know, Do you where, know your where your true, true loyalty, loyalty lies, lies Varix? But it worked. Varix, Varix. Perhaps Fickrell could be cured. Perhaps, if what Varric suspected was true, and Fickrell's corruption was related to the prince's affliction, Aldrin could be cured too. Varric had said as much to Petra, but she refused to listen. You will not experiment on the prince. Our prince is ill. To keep him here. Hide him from awoken eyes. Not right. Not right. I've made my decision, Varric. Varix's fingers flexed. Petra, the loyal, he sneered. Perhaps the murmurs of Kalamaria are true, yes. Petra glowered. I will handle Aldrin. You will not touch him. She turned sharply on her heel and strode out. Varix hadn't seen her since. He devoted all his time to the servitor chain and to his private thoughts. Where loyalty lies. Variks' experiment succeeded, but not how he expected. Ingestion of the etheric concoction still resulted in fallen death. It was not, by any means, a life-sustaining substance. It was, however, a life-giving substance. Though the dark ether lingered like a heavy fog, it also seemed to reach out towards the empty vessels. In this case, it found the dead dregs that littered his floor. It slipped inside their corpses like a slow inhalation, inflating them, stretching them, to the point of boils and bursting, pulling them to their feet. The dark ether gave these lifeless dregs new life. They seethed. Their breathing was steady, but hard and fast. They rumbled as if volcanoes lived inside their chests. A black fire rose from their skins as if they burned this dark ether like a jet engine burns its fuel. What Variks really saw before him was hate-fueled rage incarnate, and the beginning of another whirlwind. They were no longer just fallen. Fickrell called them his scorn. Behind him, Fickrell <laughs> laughed and laughed and laughed until he abruptly stopped. At that exact moment, the scorn dropped to the floor, 
dead once more. Your scribes, your kells, your houses, they will all soon be forgotten, like the elders and the scarth before them. Fikril growled in Varix's precious high speak of judgment. This drew Varix closer, face to face through the cell's porthole. Fikril turned his ear upward, listening, brought his attention back to Varix. Father says... The pause hung heavy in the air. Father says you know where your true loyalty lies. The fanatic stepped back from the porthole and waited. Loyalty. True loyalty. He expected a memory of Mara to appear in his mind. But instead... Instead he found himself thinking about the prophecies of House Rain. Kell of Kells. Days later, Varix performed his duties for the last time. He visited Central Control ran a test sim on the security systems, made some adjustments based on the results, revised and signed off on the daily roster rotations. Finally, he had a private conversation with the prison's sole remaining high servitor. The prison of elders would not go without a warden. He did not speak to Petra. By the end of that day, the prison of elders descended into chaos. Your time will come, Varix. Aldrin sits in his favorite spot, gazing in his favorite direction. She told me so. She has but one last wish for you. <laughs> no, your grace. Ferrex's voice was gravelly with emotion. It is I who has one last service for you. Ferrex left before he could change his mind. A klaxon blared. The voice of the prison's high server echoed over the loudspeakers, in Varix's voice. Security system malfunction. Emergency shutdown and reboot commencing. The place dropped momentarily into darkness, but emergency lighting quickly illuminated the cell block. All around him alarms sounded, warning lights flashed, pneumatics hissed, and cryogenic fluids evaporated to fog as the cryo cells lining this cell block began to open. Varix moved as quickly as he could towards the exit not bothering to look back, for he knew what he would see. The scorned barons in Prince Aldrin were free, as was every single resident of the Prison of Elders. Varric slipped out under cover of prison anarchy, through the same secret passage which Petra and Cade had smuggled Prince Aldrin. There, a ship waited, loaded with the prison's ether stores. As he walked, he made two recordings to be sent out by the prison's relays once he was away. For the first, he disabled his voice synth and began, in the deep resonance of high speak, to give commands. He didn't know how many would answer Judgment's call, but he had to try. For the second, he turned his voice synth back on. <clears throat> they call me Betrayer, I who was most loyal. They do not think I hear the words, bug, insect. He paused. Fallen. Up, long strides, fast now, along the ramp into the ship, towards the bridge, a vandal in wolf colors saluted him as he passed. I hear the words, House of Judgment always hears, no choice to keep the houses together. He paused again as he reached the bridge of his ship. Judgment always hears. The great machine stood in judgment. Elixni fell to fighting, fell to hate. Emotion caught in his voice. Cannot stomach this hate. As he spoke, the ship's engines rumbled to life. On the screens, Varix could see explosions resonating through the prison, his former charges running rampant. His ship passed through the bay's barrier and began to move off. Nowhere else to go. No one else to be here. He drew himself up to his full height. And so I become Varix, the Kell, House Judgment Envoy to the Elixni people. No choice, he repeated, chuckling deep in his throat. 
His voice was calm. Elixni must rise. Yes.